when I was 17, uh, I wrote a short film called The Dirk Diggler Story. Did you? Yeah, and I actually shot it mm -hmm. on videotape. Right. And it was, it had like a sort of, like Zelig slash yeah. Spinal Tap kind of format, the sort of fictional documentary, yeah. you know, which, you know, I was just a Zelig fan and a Spinal Tap fan. Mm -hmm. And I was also, you know, 17 years old, so I was completely immersed in watching porno, mm -hmm. you know, in a kind of, in a kind of horny young boy way, mm -hmm. but also in like a sort of, in like a filmmaker way. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to make movies and here were these terrible movies, mm -hmm. but that I also kind of got off on them and they mm -hmm. were so goofy and bad, you know? So sort of all those things were kind of, and I, and I lived in the valley too, mm -hmm. in the San Fernando Valley, which is the capital of porn production. So it was always kind of peripherally around me. There was a warehouse near where I went to high school that had, uh, it was like, here would be sort of like a, a portion of the warehouse that had some signage, you know, and then there'd be mm. another one with a big sign, and then just like a stretch of warehouse that had no signage at all, mm. but a ton of like expensive cars parked out in front. So yeah. you're like, what the fuck is going on inside that one with no with no uh, sign, you right. know? <laughs> and you know, it's clear they're making porno movies. So I, I just stuck. This, and the story obviously stuck with me for for nine years. You know, I was mm. um, nine, ten years. I was 20, 25, 26 when I made it. So, um, that's your first film. It's actually my second movie. Mm. Boogie Nights is my second movie, <clears throat> and um, uh, Heart Eight or Sydney mm. is my first one. This is a movie that I wrote and directed. It was my first movie, and I had the most horrendous time through the editing process. It was just like financed by people whose roots were in television, mm -hmm. bad television, like Baywatch mm -hmm. type television stuff, and who decided to try and get into movies and. It was just a situation where clearly they hadn't read the script, you know, mm. and I delivered the movie and they were sort of really confused and all I could do was kind of point to the script and say, this is what I shot, this is what you paid for, this is what you agreed to. And this sort of argument would always come up, well, the script is not the movie and the movie is not the script. It's mm. like, but that's the agreement, mm. you know, and I stuck to it. What do you think about, if you've seen a lot of porn movies, what do you think about the level of that's just the way they're made. Could could they be better? Oh yeah, I mean, mm. God, there's so much to talk about here because porno movies, they could be a genre. Yeah. You know, and they should be a yeah, genre. I think so. You know, like um, I, I, let, let me put it to you this way: there's a whole series of John Holmes movies, mm -hmm. and they're called like the Johnny Wad, and it was this character he created where he was this sort of suave, sophisticated detective. It's a lot like the Brock Lander stuff yeah. that Dirk Diggler creates. It's sort of all modeled after that. Mm. And he's this kind of Humphrey Bogart detective, and he's a little bit James Bond, a little bit Sam Spade, you know? Yeah. And just think about that structure. They're essentially murder mysteries, right? Right. But they're also fuck films. Mm -hmm. So you're on the hook in this sort of just, it's just pure story, and you're just pure what's gonna happen next. I wanna see you fuck, I wanna see him defuse the bomb. Mm -hmm. It's exciting, it's like. Uh, well made? Well, they don't really pull, they pull it, they pull that off because they're, they're actually sexy because they're on film, yeah. and, and, and uh, certainly just it helps that the girls are um, at least a natural, you know what I mean? If you're mm -hmm. looking at it as a pure sort of hormone boy way, you're like, you know, my sort of, my sort of, like, my hormones go towards, like, uh, oh, she's pretty. Mm. And no, she doesn't have huge, enormous fake tits that, mm. and this flat washboard stomach that mm. just somehow doesn't feel real to me. It's like watching science fiction. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a sci-fi movie at that point, you know? There's, there's girls, like, there's, like, a little zit on her butt, you know what I mean? Mm. She's got a little tummy, you know what I mean? And her tits aren't out to here. And you're sort of watching sort of natural... And the same thing with the guys. It's kind of like... Yeah. The guys are not appealing in porno today. No. And, it's, and I'll be the first to say, yeah, that guy is sexy looking, or I mm. want to see him fuck. But there's no, there's like fucking robots, you know mm. what I mean? So if you start with the acting, mm. and not even just the acting or the dialogue, just sort of physically looking at these people who are just chiseled to perfection, mm. and there's nothing you can relate to. You instantly, it doesn't make sense to you. It's mm. watching space aliens. Okay, so there's that. Mm. Now with the Johnny Wad stuff, it's pretty, it's it's well, it's pulled off because it also has a sense of humor about itself. Mm. And when it doesn't, boy, it's really funny to laugh at. Mm. But it's also really funny to laugh with, you know, when it knows. It knows. Mm. It's not taking itself too seriously. And it does a good job. And John Holmes is quite an actor. Mm. He's really natural, you know. But the main thing is that a lot of the sex doesn't happen for the camera. Mm. 
And that's the thing is that, and that's what most porno actors complain about, is that every position in porno is completely uncomfortable yeah, yeah. because it's completely unnatural. It's for the camera. It's like having an actor, like, can you cheat a little bit this way? Sure. And they're going... No, but that's not my eye line. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they feel, like, stiff or something. Yeah, yeah. Porno acting and sex scenes in the 70s were much more sort of... Um, let the camera figure it out. Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? So the camera's a bit more sort of handheld and a little bit sort of more renegade in trying to get into the spot to get the good juicy close-ups that right. you want to get. Somehow it comes off feeling more sexy and natural. Yeah, you know? of course. But nowadays, you rent a porno movie and it's just they're in, they're in sort of contortions and positions that are clearly guided towards the camera. Mm. But you can't... They don't make a fucking bit of sense or, mm. and don't come off as sexual in any way, you know? Mm. I mean, the goal of a porno movie, I think, should be to give you a boner. It's almost like we have a duty here, mm -hmm. you know. We sh somebody should be making better stuff here mm -hmm. that doesn't leave you quite so devastated. Right. Well, I think some of that devastation comes from just watching the sadness and a lot of the performers' faces yeah. that you see nowadays. I mean, you really kind of instantly go to, who are they? How how did they get there? And mm. and and how can I help? Yeah. You know what I mean? The sort of save me instinct. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and there's a lot of sort of save me faces in that industry mm. that are just kind of going, you know, almost yeah. like they're looking at into the lens going, save me, wink, wink, you know. Yeah. You know, in the late 60s, sort of early 70s, when the sort of, when sort of porn was sort of fashionable mm. and okay to see in the theater, you know, as a sort of date movie. You know, the thing, and, you know, Deep Throat was the highest grossing independent film mm -hmm. of all time, you know. Behind the Green Door was happening. But Midnight Cowboy was also happening. Yeah. See, what I think... What would have happened had it not been for video is that more and more the sort of porn movie would have come Crossover. closer to, you know, a l sort of legitimate, mm. you know, uh, na tra just traditional narrative stuff. Traditional narrative stuff moving more towards p sort of porno like it elements. it kind of did in other world cinemas, mm -hmm. like in Japanese, like mm -hmm. I know Corrida and... Or Spain, Spain and French mm -hmm. movies on what Pedro does. Totally, Pedro does, mm -hmm. and, or, or even in Betty Blue. One example I've used before is, and it's not sort of doing it to be salacious or anything like that. It's saying like, how interesting would it have been to see Forrest Gump mm. and Robin Wright, you know, and, and that Robin Wright character sure. make that baby that we see at the end. Mm -hmm. That sex scene. How does Forrest Gump have sex? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a great character, I think. Yeah. And it's not trying to sort of just give you a boner to show you Tom Hanks and Robin Wright, you know, see your tits in bed. It's mm -hmm. going, what What could be more sort of human? A, a human? Mm -hmm. Or what could be more of a, like, re revelation mm -hmm. of a, a character than watching them have sex? Yeah. I mean, that says a lot about someone, sure. I think, is how they sort of touch another person in bed. I wrote a scene that I kind of wish I'd filmed that I know shouldn't have been in the movie mm -hmm. of Boogie Nights, <clears throat> but it was for Don Cheadle's character Buck and his wife Jesse to, they decide to have sex, you know, at night, they're sort of lying in bed, and they try and have sex real. Mm. <laughs> they kind of suggest yeah. each other, like, maybe we could try and do this, like, real, like... And, they, and Don starts to fuck up a little bit because he starts saying, oh, baby, yeah, baby, baby, you know? Right. And she's like, and then he kind of catches himself, and then she starts doing it. It was a very sort of funny, small, mm -hmm. tender scene where you kind of watch these two people who are, who are so caught it. up. We didn't shoot it. Oh, I wrote yeah. it, and we rehearsed out, and it was great. But I knew it would never be in the movie, you Why? know? Um, I think that's really strong. I couldn't get it in. I couldn't get it in there in any place where I knew that, that I, thought, I thought it was sort of taken care of in other places, sure. this sort of, like, porno people trying to be real people. But... It's so funny because, yeah, I've had, I've, you know, I, I, I've been with sort of a sort of situation where you're with a girl and suddenly you're like, where did this Elizabeth Berkeley showgirls sex thing come from? Mm. I, you know, do you think that's sexy somehow? Do you mm. think I'm responding to that? Do you think this flopping around that you're doing is making me excited? Do you know mm. what I mean? And I think there is, there is, the porno movies have trained a lot of young people how to have sex, unfortunately. Mm. What would you assess the time span on, on Boogie Nights? We started shooting in July of 96, shot till October, and then edited from October to October. Right. So in, in 97. Yeah. So October, October 96, we started cutting, finished everything, you know, a week before it came out, last, waiting until the last, last minute. And, and your first movie? First movie, I shot in 28 days. Right. Um, and then 
only had three weeks to do a director's cut, but then sort of got in the whole melee of fighting with this company, which 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 lasted a year essentially, right? And backed me into Boogie Nights because I thought my I thought my first movie had been taken away from me completely, mm -hmm. and the only way that I could deal with that um, was to go make another movie. Mm -hmm. So I started prepping Boogie Nights, but in the middle of prepping Boogie Nights, I had sort of sort of essentially stolen back my kind of work print elements and um, on Sydney. Mm. And um, created. How, how created, did you do that? Well, I had a dupe. I had a dupe um, a print made. You know, um, so I was able to submit that dupe uh, work print to Can. Mm -hmm. And when Can saw my cut of the film, they invited it uh, to uh, come in a certain regard. You mm. know, so it was this big deal. And I called Reicher up and I said, "Listen, I know. I, you know, I know. I have a sort of. It's your property. You guys own it." You know, I have pride of authorship, but certainly not pride of ownership here. You guys own it, but I took my dupe work print, I submitted it to can, it's in. This is a big mistake if you guys don't give me some money, let me finish the movie, and they're like, no. Really? We're not giving you, we don't care if it's can, we don't care about anything else. The great thing is, is that they're like a foreign sales company. They go there to sell their product, you know. They go to can and then the marketplace, and here they have a movie that's kind of in, in competition for in certain regard, you know. Yeah. And they're like saying, no, we don't want to be there. First of all, they weren't going to let me go, you know. They weren't going to let me take, you know, even, and I, and I didn't want to go into the fucking Grand Palais with my dupe work print. So I said, let me have the original negative elements. They'd already cut negative on their version, by the way, so yeah. I had to essentially take, I couldn't just match up my dupe work print to my negative. I mean, they'd already cut negative. Presumably they'd cut into your shots. Exactly. So wh how did you deal with that? I had to go to alternate takes, um, which, you know, w w weren't as good sometimes, but, yeah. but essentially, because there, there's a three or four very long steady cam shots, and of course they cut, you know, right into the middle of Can it. you splice back in now? You can, but you lose a frame. And it's kind of a great study in what one frame is. Because a lot of times you go along and you're like, don't miss it, we feel good. And you're cruising along and you're taking your frames off because you're fixing it and you don't feel it. And then you get to one and you're like, that one frame makes all the difference. Sure. It's insane, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't want to be feel like it does. Mm -hmm. But um, it just makes me think of this sort of issue of like, um, you know, it's funny because you were talking about being in Brussels. Mm -hmm. and. You know, where that sort of, this line is, like, you know, the, the concept that, you know, that no director has final cut, it's projectionists have final mm -hmm. cut, you know, which, you know, I, I mean, I, theaters are so fucked, you know what I mean, and you want to kind of go around and go, we, every theater in America, I mean, this THX is the biggest scam going, it's like, THX doesn't mean anything, it means that George Lucas gets a check to, to mm -hmm. say, to write, you know, for some theater that's now we're THX approved, so it sounds good, but it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and not to mention all the sort of projectors, you know, you spend all this time and you want it to look right and everything else. But I got to say that when I kind of come down off my high horse a little bit, I like to kind of like, like I, my girlfriend and I went to uh, like four or five months after Boogie Nights came out, um, I was just walking by this theater on the Third Street Promenade, you know, and I was like, let's go in and look at it. And it was this terrible Fuji print, and it just looked terrible. And mm. the scope, the ratio was all That's fucked up. That's because New Line have a, have a Fuji deal. New Line have a Fuji deal, which in I have now... In Canada. Yeah. But now, the, I got rid of that. Did you? Oh, yeah. I said, there's no way I'm making a movie here with you guys again unless I get all Kodak prints. Mm -hmm. And so they signed off, which is good. And, mm -hmm. and anyway, so I go to watch this. I'm watching this Fuji print, and it just sounds fucking terrible. Mm. And I'm kind of freaking out. But... It was long enough after the movie was finished, you know, that I started sort of calming down. I wasn't trying to control every element. And I said, if I can't enjoy this bad Fuji print, this not even sort of, not even good mono kind of soundtrack that's yeah. playing here, um, have I done my job in terms of making the movie? You know, I, I, this movie should be able to come off. The story should be able to work. Was it a fucking Fuji print, or it's not even barely mono? Mm. <laughs> you know, um, what what do I do here? Am I what what which one do I want to be? Do I want to be the guy that has a fucking Kodak print in here and it's precise and perfect, and that's the only way it can work, mm. or do I want to be the guy that goes, yeah, I know it looks like shit, it sounds like shit, but you liked it, didn't you? You know, <laughs> you know what? I want to get my get your pizza. pizza, man. Sorry, I just want to get one. Oh shit, yeah. <laughs> this would be a taco. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm gonna be the young filmmaker with mm -hmm. fucking pizza in the interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny because also too, I was with um, 
I was actually with Quentin Tarantino the other night, and we were sort of watch going through his prints, or watching some prints and stuff. And he had a Reservoir Dog 16 millimeter mm. print because I guess they make them, they make sort of 16 prints for like prisons and yeah, stuff yeah. now, you know. And it makes me want to get one of my movie, you yeah. know. Anyway, he shot it Super 35 scope, you know. And uh, but this was a sort of 133 16 print. And I was like, Quentin, you're not really gonna watch this. I, mean, I said, let's put it on. I want to. I want to see what it looks like, you know. And then I realized that it wasn't scope. And I said, you're not gonna watch your your widescreen movie in one three three. Are you? He's like, no, no, no. It would be great. Mm -hmm. And when it started up, it was so kind of exciting because it had that kind of like shitty. Was it locked immediate... off, or did they pan and scan? No, they didn't pan and scan. It was locked off. Wow. You know. Um, and it was it was kind of exciting because sure. and it was sixteen and it felt like. It felt like a different movie. It felt like someone, like a student film, mm -hmm. had done shot for shot Reservoir Dogs with yeah. the same cast. You yeah. know what I mean? Were you happy with your film? Very. The Boogie Nights. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. I can't say that. It's it's the plan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I can't even think at this point because I'm still so kind of wrapped up in it. Believe it or not, mm. that I, what I would change. I know there's probably a couple things I'd like to have done differently, but it's not like I didn't stick to my plan. Well, the idea of the firecrackers actually comes from two places. Um, it's a ba it's a distant piece of background action mm -hmm. in a movie called Putney Swope, directed yeah, yeah. by my idol Robert Downey mm -hmm. Senior. He made it like the late '60s. I mean, it's just an yeah. incredible film. And and there's this scene where this guy gets off the elevator. Wing Sony is coming through this new mousetrap device, and he's got this sort of sidekick, and uh, this guy's behind him, and just sort of pap, pap, mm. pap, and then he says three or four words, and then they get back on the elevator. Yeah. And I was like, I called Bob up, and I was like, this is the greatest fucking thing, and I want to take it, I want to run it through a whole scene and make it foreground action, you know, mm. and I want to like say that it's my idea and he yeah. was like great <laughs> and another thing is that my dad was uh, in early uh, television actually in Cleveland um, actually not early television but mm. sort of like a long time ago mid 60s and he kind of was this horror talk show host he would like come on and introduce sort of bad horror films mm -hmm. you know Beast from 50,000 Fathoms right. this kind of stuff and he would, he was one of the first guys to like chroma key himself inside the movie, you know, and like comment on how bad the dialogue was and how bad the movie was and all this kind of stuff. And he would constantly blow stuff up with firecrackers, you know, and just kind of like take like little skeleton skulls and like throw firecrackers at them. And so the combination of those two sort of father figures with firecrackers, mm -hmm. there it is in the movie, you know. I mean, one of the things I loved about your film was the fact that you, you never ever took the, took the right turn on a cliche, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Everything's cliched in your film. Yeah. It's fucking great. Yeah. You know, but you then, there's a sort of real gentleness about it. Yeah. Which I found really kind of moving, actually. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm so fed up with the way films are going. I really don't like movies anymore. I, I'm, I'm, you know what? I don't know. It's so funny because I want to be with you, and, but I don't. I'm scared to say that because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm 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 bad mouthing the cause, even though I know in my ass in mm -hmm. my back pocket, it's like there's shit out there. Yeah, yeah. it sucks, but it's almost like I want to keep it to myself because yeah. I don't want anyone to see our collective cards. It's yeah. like, yeah, we're fucking up like crazy, and yeah. I wish it wasn't going on. Yeah. You know, but I don't think we are fucking up like crazy. I mean, I think you know, there's a. There's a this school and there's a that school and there's a this school and, you know, ultimately, it's about storytelling. It's about narrative drive, and that will win through. True, but don't you think? So? I mean, I just I, I like the action genre. Mm -hmm. That that little club is fucking up lately, mm -hmm. and I love those movies and I sure. want them to succeed and I want to see good action adventure films. You mm -hmm. know, I wanted Godzilla to be wonderful. I mean, I really lo I love monster movies. And and I wanted that, that like it seems that department is really not <laughs> is not sort of yeah but that that department at the moment is is a committee filmmaking process which is that's but that's unfortunate that's to like me. the sacrifice that cinema has made okay guys <clears throat> you smart boys and the odd girl you can have that genre I know. because that's money and everything and. And then the but way it's really unfortunate. I mean, that's unfortunate. I don't, I don't want, but I don't want to fluff that off as, as, a, as that's just the way that is. I think mm. it's unfortunate because there's, there's, there is such a thing to be made as, a, as an intelligent 
Godzilla movie, an intelligent sort of like action adventure film. They're out, they're out there to be made, and it's unfortunate that that sort of genre is getting killed by committee. I mean, it's almost like right around the corner the romantic comedy will be next. Well, it's happening right now, That's, actually. They turned that corner. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're getting them right now, and yeah, next will be I like. I could name a few. Yeah. Oh, I could name mm. a few this summer. I, 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 you know, I've wanted to for a long time make just. Um, you know, go to a comedy, you know, a straight mm. comedy, a real romantic comedy in the most traditional way, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, fuck it up in an untraditional way, but a traditional sort of dive into it thinking it was traditional. Yeah. But, and I, maybe it's in reaction to something about Mary, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm ready to go like right away.